Okay, so welcome everyone to this virtual version of the Humanities Institute at Stony Brook. We are delighted today to uh, have a very distinguished colleague of us, uh, Professor Eric Haraldson, who will deliver today's lecture. And I would like to welcome you all uh, in the most, war in the warmest possible manner, and certainly Professor Haraldson, uh, as we uh, continue the activities of the Institute throughout the spring and before I Going to a more formal introduction, I would like to alert you to the some more the interesting business at hand, which is today's talk. Uh, my professor, Eric Haraldson, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce him today to you. Uh, he holds the Empowerment Charitable Trust Endowed Professorship in Global Citizenship at the English Department at Stony Brook University. He started his career as a specialist in 19th century American novel and poetry, but his interests and work have grown to encompass American modernism and the literature of the emigre, displaced, and the minority and minority authors. These interests convey an intellectual pilgrimage from the national through the cosmopolitan and onto the global that has become his current central field of research. His book, Henry James and Queer Modernity, published by Cambridge University Press, explores, explores dissident sexual politics in the writings of James, Willa Cather, Ernest Hemingway, and Gertrude Stein. He's editor and co-editor of both reference and research volumes. For example, with John Hollander, he co-edited the award-winning 19th century volume for the Encyclopedia of American Poetry. Together with Kendall Johnson, he co-edited The Critical Companion to Henry James, and he has also edited a collection of essays entitled Reading the Middle Generation Anew, which uh, is dedicated to poets like Robert, Robert Lowell, Elizabeth Bishop, and John Berryman. Together with John Carlos Rowe, he has edited the Oxford Historical Guide to Henry James. Professor Haraldson has published extensively on the emergence and cultural resonance of Anglo-American modernism while serving on the editorial boards of journals such as Coradiana, 20th Century Literature, and American Literary History. Recently, he had uh, the great pleasure of directing the multi-year project Global, C Global Citizenship, Citizenship and World Literature, which is mainly what really uh, got us together, Eric, in a way. Uh, I have personally the pleasure of benefiting from Professor Haraldson's commitment to the critical incorporation of global citizenship in Stony Brook's curriculum. And it was through the cycle of lectures on this empowerment, oh, sorry, on this uh, global citizen, citizenship and world literature that, uh, that we participated together in, in several and also several talks. Uh, so as we engage in conversation over the best ways to develop a global studies major at Stony Brook, his insights were instrumental for me as I strive to define and shape the curriculum for this major, which at the time was only a project and is now a fully working academic option for students directed under the splendid directorship of Sophie Leroy, Professor Sophie Leroy. So thank you, Eric, for that. And today's Professor Harrelson will speak on global citizenship, citizen, citizens, global perils, the limits of an ideal, a very timely talk. And thank you for taking up this topic. So please join me in providing the warmest welcome to Professor Eric Haraldson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, you're very kind, uh, just as I remember you. And uh, <laughs> we do indeed have history. Uh, and uh, I'm picking up your phrase. It has been a great pleasure collaborating with you um, in many different uh, adventures and venues. And uh, so thank you kindly for uh, inviting me to the Humanities Institute. Thanks to Adrian. We, I think we were in, uh, as, as young children, I believe we were in daycare together here at Stony Brook. Isn't that true, Adrian? 
Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was the elder party. I mean, let's face it. No, but, it's been uh, a long time. <laughs> it's a long time, a long time and a good one. Uh, so it's a real um, treat to be to be here today. And perhaps like some of you, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. Uh, I actually wanted to start with, uh, it seemed to me that this, uh, you know, it, this all needs some grounding in uh, the world of text we're enmeshed in. Uh, so, and, and so I'll read this to you for your um, uh, edification or uh, distraction, whatever it turns out to be. A global citizen, it's not long, a global citizen <clears throat> cultivates a consciousness that challenges ethnocentrism and the ideas of belonging and identity that nation states inflict upon us. A global citizen cannot be mentally bound by arbitrary political borders, but challenges socially constructed forces that aim to divide and exclude. A global citizen recognizes the humanity in everyone without social categories and is aware of how interconnected our spaces and lives really are. Most importantly, being a global citizenship means to remain vulnerable and open to other beliefs and other ways of life. Global citizenship essentially is a collective mindset uh, about diversity and unity. I hope you appreciate that immensely. <laughs> Uh, I can say that without too much egotistical investment because I didn't write it. That it was written by one of our Stony Brook undergraduates, um, Rachel Heineke, who uh, won the Global Citizenship Essay Contest. Uh, this is a portion of what she wrote, which I think is stunning. And uh, she... Um, she double majored in psychology and sociology and double minored in history and Latin American studies. Um, so uh, I don't, it's a hard act to follow, but I'm gonna add a few uh, phrases of my own. Um, and I want to, all right, anyway. Which structures of feeling, modes of, modes of intellectual praxis, and vigorous engagements with a world chronically in need are not encompassed by the rubric global citizenship? Uh, I'm interested in the ways in which uh, the terms conceptual flexibility sponsors a laudable activism. At the same time, its basic elusiveness leaves some accomplishments floating in suspense. Uh, I associate the term with inquiry, teaching, most of what I'm going to have to say today centers on our students and the, cl the classroom that we're returning to, the classroom experience uh, and campus as well. Inquiry, teaching, clarification, and practical guidance. Um, uh, much of this is perforce uh, uh, situated in literary expression. And that's because that's where I feel most confident in terms of my own expertise, interested as I am in other media. Authors often disclaim, if not disdain the idea that their work uh, directs a perplexed humanity into new modes of being or morality. Uh, but there's no arguing really that uh, their, their works enlarge our sensibilities, challenge our beliefs, 
and point the way to meaningful actions. Perhaps most constructively, these trenchant works of fiction advance pressing questions. I had some quotation from Milan Kundera saying, you know, this is a noisy world full of answers. I'm interested in questions, words to that effect. Um, global citizen, this is the last kind of definitional uh, uh, segment here. It names an intellectual and spiritual posture of aspiration, mindfulness, and readiness. I think cultivating that readiness is what we're doing um, one way or another with through one uh, set of materials or another in one classroom or another. It describes a course of study that is omnivorous, which is to say random and opportunistic, which is to say at times a hot mess. It fosters the building of bridges from knowledge and understanding to activism. Traditionally, for the term is ancient, it seeks to alleviate, and I do not say to cure, some of the world's ills and perennial challenges. A short list would be uh, human suffering, animal suffering, inequalities of power and resources, uh, those inequalities inscribed in race, sex, and gender regimes, the plight of the displaced, environmental degradation, poverty, abuses of social justice, and basic human rights, not meant to be exhaustive, but highlights. Um, these uh, uh, strike me as um, global citizenship. I, I, I would conclude this business by saying global citizenship designates an extravagant ideal of learning, striving, and engaging that must always fall short on the ground. By the same token, it is a bit like breathing. When we are short of breath, can we afford to stop entirely? These are articles of faith underlining global citizenship education, and they depend on leaps of faith. We will fall short. We will always achieve an increment of hope and meaning. Uh, and um, I, I, I like to quote Rabbi Tarfan, who has to say to us, it is not upon you to complete the task, but you are not free to be idle from the task. A wise admonition. So someone mentioned literature. I guess that was me. Um, I wanted to start with where I often start in my classes, um, which is with, sometimes it's not even on the syllabus, it's just kind of thrown it as a, as a welcome. Uh, uh, but, uh, I, and when I teach, I, like we all do, I have, certain mentors in mind. Um, one particular mentor is William Gass, a novelist, novelist and philosopher. He studied with Wittgenstein. Um, and he, he tells us, um, your attitude toward your material, whatever it may be, has to be deep and warm. You are the teacher. You've got to be in love with the stuff on your syllabus. Continuing, what, what you do as a teacher, what you do is establish, uh, and this is similar to a sermon, a model for your involvement. You try to convey the importance of your closeness to the subject. 
that isn't exactly taught to students, it's exemplified. You can have a chance to introduce people to wonderful things, but then you have to treat those wonderful things in such a way that they stay wonderful. You can't kill them. That keeps me up at night. So what is this? Uh, I'm bound <laughs> when I came in the room, Adrian was popping around and now I'm here popping around. It's contagious. Uh, but the, the work I like to read to students, if the leaning of the syllabus is toward uh, global consciousness raising, global mindedness or mindfulness is uh, a well-known poem. You've all encountered it somewhere along the way, Musée de Beaux-Arts by W.H. Auden. And uh, there's a lot of context for this that I will sort of forego. Uh, but I, I, well, I must say, I was curious to know why this poem, which is about human suffering, is uh, was written when it was, what was Auden on Auden's mind. Um, and I realized that if you start in the year in which it was written, it was written toward the end of December, end of the year 1938, a lot of you are already going ding, ding, ding. Um, uh, that year starts with Auden and Christopher Isherwood going to the to witness the Sino-Japanese War. Um, it, this is followed by the Anschluss. Uh, this is followed by the incursions in the Sudetenland. This uh, and then the expulsion of po Pol Polish Jews. Then Kristallnacht the pogrom, the constructions of Dachau and Buchenwald. So now we are worked, worked our way up to December when this poem is written. Uh, it's nowhere in the poem and it's everywhere in the poem. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out Guernica, I'm leaving out the phony war. The turmoil, let's just say the extraordinary turmoil and here's Auden contemplating a canvas by Peter Bruegel, The Fall of Icarus. And the, the game to play with one's students, because, you know, I have to get my entertainment somewhere, is to say, okay, this is The Fall of Icarus. Where is Icarus in the painting? And as, as you know, Icarus is barely in the painting, and that's the point. Uh, Icarus is a pair of legs about to disappear permanently under, un, into the sea. Um, but the lines that interest me are not going to gloss the whole poem. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position, how it takes place while, so, while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. The poem ends with everybody, and he sort of says, if you look at the picture, everybody's turning away from the doomed boy. And that includes the farmer and the fisherman and the, uh, the, sh the little ship, the delicate ship, as, as he calls it. Um, everybody saw or heard something. Th this is key. Everybody saw something amazing everybody in appalling and some everybody uh, you know was exposed to the disaster in some way but by the same token it wasn't deemed um an appreciable disaster or failure and so as it ends this boy falling out of the sky the the ship had somewhere to go uh, to get to i'm sorry and sailed calmly on now, what's fascinating to me about this poem and what I try to get my students to say uh, or feel is that it's, uh, uh, it's a brilliant 
um, it's, it starts with that phrase, the human position of suffering, which is, an, is a kind of a superfluous phrasing. We're talking about human suffering, so why, why this human position? But positionality is what intri intrigues Auden that um, somehow the things that we ought to, and I guess ought to, that's the teaching, ought to be engaged with in some, we, there's some intervention, there's some at least witnessing that should uh, transpire. And such is, so are we constructed or such is life constructed that we go on plowing, we go on fishing, we go on sailing, we go on walking dully along or opening a window mundanities and uh meanwhile the spectacular suffering is is in our vicinity Wh why can't we bridge to that in some compassionate way why can't we take action um and i hear in the poem you know it's funny because everybody says oh it's a poem of philosophical reflection it's a poem of rage. It's a poem. It's a poem that encapsulates everything that's happening in the world that in that year, and that Auden is a, a witness to in many ways. So I guess all I'm trying to say is that it's important that one uh, grasps the you know the kind of anger at the human position of humanity which is inhuman, and also perhaps the undertones of self-criticism and self-scorn even that uh, emanate from the poem. For my classes, it's just a conversation opener because we're, we're going to then proceed into uh, numerous, uh, a syllabus that, um, you know, it's not about despair by any means, or but it's definitely about existential difficulties, about real world uh, uh, trauma and so forth. Um, one thing I have learned by virtue of hard knocks of my dull brain, and, and that is that, and I, I'll be curious to hear in, in Q&A, what your experience has been along these lines. I work almost exclusively with short forms, meaning short stories and lyric poems, uh, and maybe uh, extracts from the autobiographical uh, or, or from the memoir of, of, of the, the writers in question. Um, I have a little note here. On, I'm looking at some of the, the courses I've taught and I'm gonna tell you give you, try to be discreet and give just quick summaries of, of what they are. Uh, but I made a little note to myself on the side here. Um, it's from Homi Baba. And, you know, it says, you know, he says, he's kind of impatient <laughs> with, quote, the frothy fellowship of cultural globalists. And uh, I confess, um, I feel indicted by that phrase to some degree, uh, but uh, I have what I have to work with in the way of uh, textual sources. And, and anyway, uh, let's just say that briefly, um, I, oh, I didn't mention the obvious uh, rationale for the shorter, for shorter works is you can actually keep up with yourself on the syllabus and you can find not too coercive um, ways, by that I mean something like a discussion board forum in which to continually coax your charges along in, keep, in, in, in doing the readings. Um, and, uh, and we get much better class discussions that way. And some learning happens, and uh, um, and some most of this is constructed with an eye toward 
further using the literature to kind of for maybe not further define global citizenship but but to ask what application might be made between a story a poem and and uh, global responsibility uh, a more and a, a more dedicated and committed human position uh, I will just mention that the authors who go over the biggest on my 100 level uh, uh, course for uh, mostly STEM students uh, would be, uh, I have something like 15 uh, authors from as many different uh, parts of the world, but they would include um, Natalia Ginsburg uh, and uh, Xu Ting, the poet Xu Ting, Juno Diaz, um, Margaret Atwood, certainly, uh, Papa, Papa, um, Eduardo Galeano. Uh, just, you know, to give, as I say, a kind of cursory sampling um, and you know, I've found that my inclination and, and what seems to work best for the students is not to front load questions about morals, meanings, messages, how this translates into, you know, your role as a, uh, a citizen of whatever, up to and including the globe, but rather you know, to work through the story on its own terms, in a certain sense, honoring the, the author in the process, and then, you know, asking them to notice um, what, how far the critique in the story might extend. Uh, there's a story that is not, to my mind, nominally political by Julio Cortazar, uh, bestiary, which teaches very well and you know the students it's the students who come to realize that it essentially amounts to a kind of powerful statement of feminism between generations and um and uh empowerment of uh well a young protagonist um they get a little distracted because it's one of the characters is a surrealist tiger that happens to be a real tiger. You can see where the confusion might come from. Um, and the tigers, the tiger becomes an important player in the empowerment drama. All right, that's zipping around. Um, I, what, the other thing I've tried to do Excuse me for a moment while I take my watch off. The other thing I've tried to do is to game the system a little bit. And by that, I mean, uh, I was uh, teaching a course that's called single author at the advanced level, uh, advanced undergraduate level. And um, the single author I chose was Franz Kafka. And much to my amazement, uh, a story that uh, became profoundly popular and I think educative was a hunger artist. Now, on the face of it, you or I might say, well, of course, I don't know. But, um, you know, stu you know, stu you know, our students, they move through this progression of phases where, you know, something is like so weird. And, and the first part of your discussion with them is that was so weird. And then they wonder about you as a professor and what your peculiar tastes are. And then they start writing again, a discussion board invaluable uh, um, um, to articulating wherein lies the weirdness and wherein lie the teachings and how far can we take them into a kind of, um, you know, a kind of human awareness, conscious, again, I use the term consciousness raising. 
But the thing was that I thought, geez, a whole semester of Franz Kafka. Would any of you sign up for a whole semester of Franz Kafka? Uh, oh, some of you would. There's always one or two. Uh, well, <laughs> I'll send you the brochure. Uh, but, you know, all right, so this is happening during the pandemic. And uh, I'm, I'm, so I smuggled in when the English department wasn't looking. Um, actually, I, I had their full approval, but uh, uh, seven other authors, world authors uh, from Germany, Argentina, Switzerland, Austria, South Africa, slash uh, 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 Australia, that's Kutsia, of course, um, and China, uh, Tan Shui, uh, who is a fabulous writer. She's going to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, and uh, she writes these, she's written a full monograph on Kafka for Yale Press, and, and her stories are, you know, Kafka-esque. You know, so there's a, and then there was this guy, Philip Roth. I included him as well. Um, that's, a, that's a good, Kafka is a character in the story. Uh, so anyway, you would know who I'm alluding to here, I, I suspect. Um, and I just thought it, it really kind of enriched, it extended the, the globalness of Kafka out into the globe. Um, there's a master's course I could talk about. Well, I'll, I'll let you Q&A me on that if you want, but uh, I'll just mention the names Zebalt, Harabal, Yuhua, Tokarchuk, Murakami, and Tanpinar, uh, among others. And not all of these texts, I should say, are like, I don't sit down and say, geez, you know, these have to have a global citizenship impulse, impetus, you know, not necessarily, uh, but many of the things that we get out of them in class can, can go that way and be developed toward that. Uh, okay, I'm trying to, that Adrian is such a strict taskmaster. I'm looking at my watch here. Uh, I know we want to reserve some time for q and I certainly do. Um, oh, I have a little, I'll just put this aside. Uh, um, that, but uh, if, if we come to this, there's to me the interesting pedagogical challenge. What do you do if you teach a story that has a kind of, you know, strenuous politics of, uh, in this case, you know, feminism and, you know, defense of, of certain kinds of roles for women in society. And you have a student who gets it wrong <laughs> and publishes the reading, his or her reading to the entire class and says, you know, the mother in this story is is despicable and so on and so forth. Uh, how do you, you know, obviously we, we've learned ways to kind of work with this, but th this has happened to me not infrequently. So that's, you know, again, just how do you manage the class discussion? In that case, I usually resort to saying, well, when, when you write your paper and you make that argument, what if I were to write a paper in which I had a counter argument that said no, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of try to depersonalize it, but in any case, we're going to end with two little footnotes. One is to say that I'm so, so, so pleased to see that uh, Adrian, Sophie, Andrea Fedi, uh, that the architects, uh, of the major and the minor have language requirements. Um, Shirin last week, uh, it was interesting to me, she gestured toward dance and music, but she just kept going language, language, language. Uh, I thought of a little mini unit for some course in the future. I would take uh, some pages of the marvelous book by Amar Mufti called Forget English, Orientalisms and World Literature. 
I would like to cover, I've done it before, the poem, The Armenian Language is the Home of the Armenians by Musa Hishkan. Um, I would love to bring in Merwin's Losing a Language, so, so moving and, and so powerful uh, about linguistic colonialism in Hawaii. And then uh, finally, I have this uh, little set piece from Olga Tokarchuk's book, Flights, novel Flights. This is, uh, came out after she won the Nobel Prize. The, I don't wanna talk about the book. I just say this, here's what she does with those of us who wander around the world, which is our oyster because we speak English and so does the world. And so she, it's, really, it's really sharp. We have our own, now she's talking about Poles, Central Europeans. We have our own languages hidden in our carry-on luggage, and we only ever use English when we travel abroad. It's hard to imagine, but for people out there using English, I'm sorry, out there, English is real, a real language, and often their only language, hard to believe. They don't have anything else to fall back on in moments of doubt, how lost they must feel in the world, where all the instructions, all the lyrics of the stupidest songs, all the menus, all the excruciating brochures are in their private language. They may be understood by anyone at any moment, whenever they open their mouths. They must have to write things down in special codes. I heard there are plans in the works to get them some little language of their own. One of those dead languages no one else is using anyway, just so that for once they can have something just for themselves. Isn't that wonderful and puckish? The last thing I will forego also for the moment, and that is, uh, sorry, everything looks so, uh, Dis disorganized and highlighted, but this is how I'm holding my life together. <laughs> I would like to go into the future projects that we are contemplating under the rubric of uh, global citizenship, um, which include, I just give you categories, uh, collaborations, collaborations, and more collaborations. Um, uh, one toward a, an international global citizenship essay contest or media multimedia contest. Uh, so there's that. Um, there's, uh, there's another uh, wonderful girls education, international girls education effort underway. I'm speaking with the woman who is in charge, who, who, who conceived of that. Um, there's uh, a, this continuation of the speakers series you know, so details to follow, but I did want to, you know, kind of give a forecast of, a hopeful forecast of where the, you know, the projects of yesteryear have mutated and evolved into some, some next phase. And I'm going to leave it at that because that's the right time. Um, uh, yeah, I, I spared you. I just want you to feel some gratitude toward me. I spared you a discourse on uh, Roberto Bolaño's 2666, and especially the part about the crimes, which was going to be, which I'll just say is teachable in an undergraduate classroom, quite teachable but I can't say why right now because I'm, I'm muting myself in several senses. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. And uh, you give us a lot of food for thought and we welcome now questions for what I hope will be uh, a, you know, a very enlightening exchange and debate. I, uh, you can either share them through chat or raise your hand. I don't have everybody on the screen because there are more people than my screen allows. But if you have a question, go ahead and uh, 
I might, uh, might, start, might want to start with a, with a thought, maybe more than a question. You were telling us about Kundera's uh, predilection for questions rather than answers. And I was thinking that you have, you have presented a, a, an aspirational model of global citizenship. And, um, and I, was, I kept thinking about uh, the, the two other variants of each one is which, you know, the implicit one in which whether we want it or not, as this pandemic has made very clear, uh, we are part of the global citizenship uh, project that is, uh, that is going, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, whether the, all this retrenchment into nationalism of many uh, Western democracies, <laughs> actually, and uh, they like it or not, but we are part of this, uh, and the, pa the pandemic has made it, you know, clear to even the non-believer. The pragmatic one, which is a one that I associate with our students, in which they are de facto living as global citizens in a very, in very peculiar uh, globes. They are, they are different and unpredictable to us, at least to me. Uh, so we have, you know, on campus, certainly, many varieties of global citizens that, uh, that are possible because of the way you know, many times markets or cultural flows or histories or even uh, unprogrammed uh, like adhesical uh, coincidences make these globes, these little parts of the globe uh, into a, a unit in which it's very easy to, uh, to go through. And, and the States participates in many, the United States participates of many of those globes. And that's where our students, many of our students come from, from different entry points into that. And I was thinking, in what way do you negotiate that in your classes, that de facto <clears throat> global citizenship that our students are actually experiencing, in which, which at least for me are unpredictable many times. I, you know, I'm surprised to, to meet a, a Chinese student in my class who has uh, extensive knowledge about a history that I have no idea of, or very, very limited idea of, and I'm introducing them sometimes to Latin American or Spanish culture that sometimes I think, why should they know about this dictator or whatever? It's like, they're, <laughs> I'd be happier not to know about that history. <laughs> so, so it's like, how do you negotiate those different globalities that, are, that emerge from the ex actual experience, pragmatic experience of our students versus the aspirational one that you uh, aim to? Yes, um, that's uh, a wonderful question. I'm trying to figure out. Um, I, I'm, I, I have to just, I always have to kind of unload the anecdote <laughs> before it disappears from my mind. But I was thinking about, um, I had a student of Russian descent and we were reading a story uh, by Aksayanov, uh, and uh, it, it culminates with a very florid, rhetorically outrageous speech from essentially the mystery man, the commissar, and so on and so forth. And I said to the class, because, you know, I'm the professor, I do know everything, and I said, uh, I said, you know, anything that's, the rhetoric that's this exaggerated is false. And the reassurances that this commissar is giving to his underling is foreboding. This is, uh, this is not going to end well. And very politely, they always very politely correct the professor. She said, actually, this is exactly how a Russian official would express himself for, you know, and, you know, and, and I, was, I was a little chagrined at first, but I thought, this is good. This is what you want. You want students who sort of say, you know, I have a knowledge base, is what you, you were describing. I have a knowledge base that you don't. And uh, I, what I've learned to be, I've, I've learned to be a little more uh, circumspect and said to sort of say, do we have anybody in this room who, by virtue of their experience, can, you know, can uh, I don't know, interpret what's going on in this, in all this code switching in this story uh, about the Dominican, uh, you know, Diaz. Um, well, anyway, what, uh, what it amounts to is that 
um, with some encouragement uh, and reassurance, um, students will kind of step forward. I mean, my I just sort of sort of I feel like my primary objective is to get them unglued from the seat of their chairs to kind of leaning into the space of discourse in the room and the text in front of them and and showing to themselves the knowledge and the authority that they have and that it's valued, you know. Um, I, I often think back to my own, believe it or not, undergraduate days. And I will, I will assure you, Adrian, that the most important, fascinating, brilliant, and memorable thing said in that in any classroom was the thing I said. Uh, there's something, you know, so I don't know what, empowering about hearing your voice, having your 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 professor endorse, you know, endorse that contribution, uh, and and then it goes it goes from there. I don't know how it goes from the pragmatic, the, the zone of the pr pragmatic, all the way to the, the global slash aspirational, um, except to maybe, maybe through some kind of reiteration to, to sort of say, you know, what you've observed is so illuminating about the story, and it also makes the story tie up, uh, uh, um, you know, dramatically with certain themes of global of globalization it doesn't have to be citizenship but of globalization or global mobility or or you know uh my my migratory you know what it's um so it's in there um but it but it usually seems to me that i it, i i think it happens more by by chance and less by my design, uh, or you know, maybe it comes out of the choosing a good text that that disturbs students into a kind of revelation, or to saying something like, "This supposedly depicts my culture, and it doesn't do so at all," or <laughs> "It's a fantasy about my culture," that sort of thing. I love it when you know you can get that kind of uh, um, rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, any other questions from uh, the audience? Celia has a question. Okay. Uh, can you unmute uh, yourself? Okay. I don't know if I can unmute you, Celia. I think Adrian can. I could too, I think, right? Yes. I just got it. I just got it. So um, first of all, I have to apologize. I'm, I'm the worst attendee because I had to come late today and I'm leaving in a minute. But Eric, <laughs> you started your career as a modernist. And, you know, it was interesting for me to hear you talk about Auden's poem because I think you're right. That's such a great poem to get students thinking about how easy it is to turn away from suffering. And you also mentioned Kafka. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about when you're teaching global citizenship, to what extent is really uh, adopting text from the contemporary moment necessary? Because obviously the global as modernists conceived of it was very different, even though Auden was more global than many of his you know, fellow writers. So I just wondered if you could reflect on that a little bit, the, the difference between teaching global citizenship with a modernist text and a contemporary text. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Um... Uh, short answer would be that the con the contemporary text uh, it uh, recreates a recognizable worldscape for them. It may make allusions to popular music. The popular music is already always already outdated, but they re they vaguely remember. <laughs> Uh, so that's the soundtrack of their lives. And so, the, the, and I, you know, I do what you do, what we all do is I con continually test, have you ever heard of, you know? Uh, but in any case, uh, so with the contemporary, I, I, I've, I guess I've, uh, I've taken the easier road 
which is to say that I don't, you know, I mean, I spent years explicating all of the philosophical and uh, scriptural contexts of Herman Melville uh, to delighted undergraduates and uh, the confidence man. I'm never, I'm never going back there, but, uh, but with contemporary, you know, so it's a little lazy, but, but the idea is, you know, we kind of want to, uh, I've been teaching some stories from Hajin, um, and that's, you know, they, they can connect to that. If, okay, so if you go to modernism, you know, all you really have to do, and I should do more of it, is to uh, work on creating socio-historical contexts um, without, you know, drawing them a too detailed map of the world in the 1920s or whatever the case. Um, I mean, uh, it wouldn't take, I always sort of feel like I'm, I'm, I'm under the clock and maybe I'm not under the clock as much, you know, for delivering the goods. And maybe I'm not as much so as I believe I am. Um, I do give, you know, uh, a kind of, you know, kind of sketchy backdrop, but I don't then say, well, what was the Anschluss and why would that have been, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, but uh, um, I think the, also the, it isn't your question because you're, you're too kind, but what about something pre-1900? Um, you know, there's plenty of material to work with there uh, that, that definitely occupies the space of the global and the, you know, and, and global relations and so on and so forth. Um, so I don't know, maybe sometime I need to get a little more historically ambitious. Um, and uh, and do the homework and put together, you know, a modicum of historical uh, setting for 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 the interesting thing about I, I don't think this was part of your question, but the interesting thing about Kafka and his contemporaries is that the students went straight to the kind of allegorical level of the writings. And they didn't need history, <laughs> you know, and they didn't need cultural situation. They didn't need to know whether Kafka wrestled with his Jewishness, um, et cetera. Uh, anyway, um, that's the best I can do. Thank you for coming. Yes, Susan has a um, question. Yes, I um, thank you very much for the talk, Eric. Um, and I, I find myself with a lot of questions in part because I am, I am not um, immersed in the, the pedagogies and theories of- You know, um, every question you have to put in another quarter. Okay, okay, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> Okay, so because I'm not um, aware of the ways that global or world literature have been defined, um, my question has to do with how do you, um, what's the, the pedagogy of, of teaching students to read globally or even constituting um, something like global citizenship? Because the, the, the possibilities are simply a kind of a sampling where let, me, let us read a variety of perspectives from a variety of countries. But is a sampling of readings, um, is a collection of readings from different cultures, uh, different perspectives, is that global literature? Is that reading globally? Um, and that's not even getting to the question of reading as global citizens. Um, your um, anecdote suggested that there are ways of reading as insiders, as outsiders. And it seems that that perspective of 
of navigating the positionality of engagement with the literature is crucial to constituting reading globally rather than just reading a series of different voices. Because it's possible, for instance, to need, read not as a global citizen, but as a global tourist. And that's a very different thing. And so right. I'd like you to distinguish between what it is that you do to engage with these texts from various countries, various perspectives, to cultivate global citizenship rather than global tourism, or any other variety of ways of engaging with um, literatures from diverse perspectives. Because is diversity the same as global? Um, is any collection of writers from different cultures, does it automatically become global? How do you engage these, these pieces in a way that um, represents and cultivates global citizenship? No, it's an excellent, excellent question. And, um, you know, I think um, I have not uh, developed, uh, and I should be doing this more, in, at least in the advanced, in the 300, 300 level classes, uh, that sort of syst systematic armature uh, of, you know, conceptualizing global citizenship and and making you know and tr and and working to continually reinforce that thematic center and 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 so on and making that kind of the unifying uh, the Germans say the rote faden the red thread um, through the sequence of readings but actually, as I'm listening to you, what I would what I would like to do, and this would require some efficiency and on my part, is to start with, you know, again the kind of stealth, uh, a sort of a stealthy approach, which is start with readings, just start with stories, and just say, here's a story from Morocco. Uh, you know, what did we learn from Morocco? Kind of delving into this. Uh, and and so on, and then just kind of you know line them up, stack them up, what have you. For how many weeks do we have in a semester? I'm new around here. Is it fourteen? Fourteen. Fourteen. That's cruel and unusual. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Uh, so you go in maybe seven representative, six representative stories. And then you have in the interstices before the next set of stories begins, you read, there's some absolutely fa fabulous uh, um, articles addressing global citizenship in, you know, very accessible uh, venues like uh, Vanity Fair, The Guardian. Um, I mean, it's actually pervasive, but the point being that uh, I would, I, I should, I could use that opportunity to kind of, to, you know, we take a, a breather while well, we're not really breathing, but uh, we we now study, uh, you know, the 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 theoretical and historical trappings of this idea or ideal that we've been using loosely. And then we look retrospectively and kind of knit together, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the ideology, if you will, and the praxis there in the original, you know, the original stories. Um, this just seems to be important because um, I, I hope I'm not underestimating our students, but I think the idea is to bait the hook, and the idea is to get them you know, just really damned curious and, and interested and subject them to a, a sequence of stories that are, you know, that are is sort of um, globalism uh, masquerading as diversity, just pop them around, I'm popping a lot today, pop them around the world and in ways that entertain them and intrigue them and, and, and and puzzle them and frustrate them. I don't care. Get a response and then say, "Let's gather up, okay? All right, let's gather up. We'll have two. Well, this week we're reading these other 
pieces that, as students like to say, are relatable to what you've been reading. Uh, <laughs> I'm just chuckling because uh, Susan will appreciate this. I can remember when Peter uh, uh, invade against relatable and wished that the word were removed from the vocabulary of all humankind. Well, he lost. Uh, I was on his side, by the way. Uh, in any case, then you, then, you know, the next phase is, and the papers would reflect this, that is to say, you know, the, all, all of our arsenal teaching wise, uh, the papers, the uh, short responses at discussion board and so forth would kind of fortify that this is what we're, you know, this is why we're reading what we're reading. And there's a kind of cogent thematic, you know, uh, thrust to, to this. And now we're moving into yet another kind of segment of, uh, of stories and poems. Uh, poems are invaluable. Poems are, are superb. And there are superb anthologies of international uh, poetry uh, I would use. But the idea, I, I would try to kind of get a little alter, what's the word, alternation uh, going on, a little rhythm of um, primary text, secondary material, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that should be done. I was wondering if I could um, offer my own answer to Susan's great question. Um, and maybe get your response and Susan's response. It's sort of a political, controversial answer. Um, so, you know, along the lines of your suggestion about thematic thrust, I think that is the right way to teach and engage students, to, to look at literature and see what's happening right now in a way that's relevant to them and bring things together. Uh, I think there's an opportunity right now to look at the nation as a unit uh, in nationalism as an ideology and use different schools of thought and literature as a coherent critique of that unit of looking at the world. And, and let me just give you three examples of this. One would be in the writings, for example, of Moshin Khamid, who talks about waning resources and how even if a nation itself is rich in those resources, there's just too much knowledge of that and attention uh, to that, that the world is aware of that, that there's an inherent pressure to distribute those resources more equitably. There's a lot of authors focusing on that theme. Number two, this is a brand new genre in the era of COVID-19, plague literature. And here I think about, you know, an author like Fang Fang um, writing Wuhan Diary or a number of people talking about being trapped at ground zero but of course the virus recognizes no boundaries. Uh, and then the third example is, is sort of dear to my own current research, which is the rapidly, especially these days, advancing frontiers of biotechnology, where there's a race for world technology that is almost impossible to keep contained um, within the local environments where it's, it's being innovated. Um, and this is across the board and there's all sorts of science and literature honing in on these various technologies, all three of which to me serve a common thesis uh, that we can't think of, of nations as a coherent unit uh, anymore for addressing ubiquitous problems. Um, and this becomes a real kind of political critique. You think about the border wall, you think about um, America first, uh, and and my question for you and Susan and others is, I go there, I'm going there now explicitly with my students. It becomes a rich conversation with them about whether there's any merit to nationalism on any level, using this literature in that way with the thematic thrust that you just referred to. And so I'll divide the course into different you know, units that sort of focus on that one, you know, sort of spokes of a wheel. Uh, is that too much of a risk? What do you think? What do you both think of that idea? Are we allowed to use emerging literature to try to capture this idea of global citizenship in a way that critiques ideologies that are so part of our worldview that we take them for granted? I mean, it's disturbing to criticize nationals, not just na nation first, but nationalism as such. 
some people find that to be threatening. Uh, what do you think? I'm looking at... I will say just thank you. Uh, that's uh, provocative. Um, you know, I, I, I will just parenthetically say, and then Susan might uh, add, chime in, uh, that uh, I've spent a lot of time studying global citizenship programs at various colleges and universities around the United States uh, and, and, uh, and England for that matter, uh, and they are prolific and uh, one thing I've noticed is that they're very careful to, it's almost like a, uh, an immediate reflex, like they'll say global citizenship means, and then it talks about the various ways in which, you know, uh, you, you're overcoming the insidious strictures of nationalist, nationalist thinking. And then comes the second uh, point, which is this does not mean that one's uh, fidelity to uh, you know one's own nation would w is in any way compromised by you know your commitment to your your interest in or commitment to globalism so there's a kind of you know kind of nervous uh, spasm that comes on the heels of the declaration of global citizenship so let's just be clear you know that this isn't uh unpatriotic or, you know, you know, trash talking the United States or whatever, um, for what that's worth. Um, but I agree, I agree with you absolutely that it has to, global citizen, citizenship, if uh, thoughtfully theorized at all, has to uh, has to come to terms with, in, in, in a very critically minded way, outmoded or, as you suggest, incoherent conceptions of the nation, nation state. I didn't know, I'm not sure if I, the second part sounded like a, a course you were developing, Andy. Was... I mean, I, I, I was really attracted by the title of your talk and, and, and these issues about using literature to press everyone to rethink assumptions um, that are politically relevant um, yeah. and lightning rods in some cases. And, and part of what you discussed uh, at the end of your remarks and then Susan um, prompted you to refer to them again, the risks that one takes in the classroom. So I, 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 you know, it was a, I, I think you answered the question, but I, I mean, I'm also curious what Susan and others might think. <laughs> well, I don't really teach global <laughs> literature as an Americanist. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't often, um, you know, so I haven't entered into that, but I do know that um, uh, the, in teaching um, the early literature um, and history, of this country, um, you can't help but touch upon issues that are very, very sensitive to people and still playing out in the present since this country never solves anything. It just keeps replaying. Um, and the one thing that I have found uh, with those sensitive issues is to choose the text carefully um, that raise the questions or reverberate with current political situations and just teach the text carefully. Um, and let the students come to whatever realization, and they do, if you teach them to read carefully. Um, uh, but I'd rather hear from someone who does teach global literature, because I am very interested in this question of, of how this category, what, what it means. Um, uh, and so if, if others have ideas about what it means to read globally, rather than just diversely or widely, um, what it means to cultivate a stance of citizenship that is global, which implies certain uh, belonging responsibilities. Um, how do those terms operate? And I'm really just asking out of curiosity because it's a field that I am not um, directly engaged with, but I find it very provocative. And the term is used so often, including Vanity Fair, I guess, that 
I want to understand what it means, um, what it can mean, uh, rather than a you know rather than just a, a general label because it's used so diversely when I encounter it that I I don't understand it and I'm genuinely interested to know how those of us who are you know who are doing the work of defining the field and teaching this field how how all of you who do this work um, approach some of those those questions just so I can have greater clarity on what this very broad term means and the meaning that perhaps you know others have have given to it or the the kinds of pedagogies that cultivate uh, something we call global citizenship so I'll be quiet I just I want to learn from those who who have been uh, teaching in this field inevitably Emily <laughs> there's a as long as you know if you promulgate um, uh, a tr any, you know, any kind of, um, I call it a catchphrase, but any kind of conceptual um, linchpin, in this case, global citizenship, if you do it long enough, then sooner or later you get, and this is not unhealthy, but you get a kind of pushback, uh, I'm thinking of Emily Apter's book, Against World Literature. I think the title gives you some idea <laughs> of, uh, uh, and it's a very sophisticated, uh, highly theorized um, argument. And she's, uh, but, uh, you know, there are some, as I say, there are some constructive challenges going, going on, as there should be. Um, so, uh, I don't know, um, but I, I do. I do think you know. I'm hearing from at least a couple of people or so that um, you know th that in some ways I need to, uh, if I you know if I want to fortify my um, uh, framework of of you know just basic course construction. I, I do need to uh, differently organize it. I do need to do up upfront definitional work and then episodic, you know, revisiting of, you know, the, uh, or um, we'll co-teach a class together and you'll present an Americanist perspective and I'll present a wishy-washy globalist perspective and, will confuse the hell out of, uh, never mind. No, but, but it'd be interesting because we would, you know, we would sort of find, uh, we would locate different points of emphases and different premises of interpretation. Of course, I'm a corrupted Americanist, so I'm not a, a perfect, uh, <laughs> I still remember you're an Americanist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, there's also, I meant to say, well, no, that's okay. Uh, I think he done. Thank you yeah. so much for your talk. I, uh, I was also drawn by the concept of globalization. Like, uh, yeah, Andrew just said, I am questioning about this concept because I believe 20th century globalization uh, is different from what we now living through in 21st century. So we have to define this concept of globalization anew uh, to teach our next generation, just to have them prepared. Uh, one of the signs that I see of 20th century globalization is use of English. You just mentioned in your, in your talk, um, speaking English, uh, dominates in discourses. So uh, that's a big sign. Uh, one of the interesting information I can share with you is North Korea, one of the uh, access evil states. English is still the most important foreign language. I don't think they teach any other language but English uh, above uh, middle, you know, secondary uh, level and uh, higher. 
So even those <laughs> isolated uh, secular states view English as the most important uh, ability. Uh, and if you want to climb up that uh, social ladder. So uh, that will continue for the time being. But what I see today is a uh, changing world, a different world. And uh, to have uh, our next generation prepared for the world, you know, per se, like a globe or the uh, international society, I think we should uh, contemplate on this concept altogether more. So come up with kind of uh, understanding and consensus so we can deliver our basic sort of frames to, to our students. So thank you so much for bringing this up and start this uh, whole conversation. I, I appreciate that very much. Everything you said, the globalization, uh, the suggestion, or I'm reading it as a kind of implication, let's say, that um, we could define globalization today and tomorrow the definition would change and so forth. It's, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's a fast variant, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, and, uh, and, but at least making some kind of effort in both our classrooms and campus and in a campus life uh, to, to solidify um, student sense of the label and more importantly, what the label, what is happening uh, to, the, to the world they are inheriting. Uh, and I, the language, the only thing I can say about the language, which is kind of peripheral, is that I'm struck by the number of authors who will deliberately write their works in English, and then they will use um, uh, the word, lang vocabulary of their native tongues. They will intersperse those words in the English and I say to my students, I think in some ways, it's an effort to remind inattentive readers that there is another language in the world besides English, and also to challenge us to do some homework. You know, when I read S Spanish language authors, I use this convenient volume. You see this? <laughs> uh, to look up and find out what the heck Galeano is saying. Uh, for instance, um, I can't wait till they invent the internet so I can get rid of this 20 pound book. But this is my Spanish uh, unabridged dictionary. The point being that, uh, and actually Sheeran talked about this last week, that she very deliberately uses kinds of mixtures of languages in her in her narratives to keep the readers on their toes and to keep the readers mindful of the linguistically complex world they live in. Anyway, for what that's worth, thank you. Okay, well, I think uh, we have reached uh, our time and it's been really wonderful to hear your thinking, Eric, and thank you so much for it. Thank you. And thank you everyone for your participation and look forward to seeing you in future events of the Institute.